welcome to the September 2024 episode of Diabetes Care on Air, a fun way to bring the research in diabetes care to life. My name is Alice Chang from the University of Toronto. And I'm Mike Rickles from the University of Pennsylvania, and we are your co-hosts for this podcast series. Special this month, we are celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial, or DCCT, with 30 years of post-DCCT follow-up completed to date in the Epidemiology of Diabetes Interventions and Complications, or EDIC, study. To commemorate this milestone, the September issue contains a collection of five new original research contributions from the DCCT EDIC study, as well as a historical perspective of these studies that change the treatment of type 1 diabetes, authored by Dr. David Nathan from the Massachusetts General Hospital, who has chaired the steering committee, and Dr. John Lakin from George Washington University, who has led the coordinating center for this landmark trial. But to really learn about the DCCT EDIC experience, Alice has a special interview set up with the current chair of the EDIC committee, a study coordinator and investigator, as well as type 1 diabetes participants who've contributed so much of their personal time, energy, and talents to keeping the DCCT EDIC not just alive, but thriving over such a long and rich period of clinical observation. And I'll follow Alice with a special interview, including some of the current investigators leading the most recent science to come out of EDIC and published this month in the journal. Well, Mike, let's let them have it with the content of this special podcast episode covering the September 2024 issue of Diabetes Care. Every person remotely involved in the diabetes space has heard of DCCT and EDIC and recognizes the incredible impact that the original DCCT and the ongoing EDIC studies have had on pretty much everything we do in diabetes. I always joke with the Endocrine Fellows that their bedroom walls should be plastered with certain landmark studies. Well, DCCT and EDIC will take up a whole lot of room. In this first interview, I have the absolute honor of spending time with some key figures in the DCCT EDIC journey to share with us some historical context, key learnings, and very importantly, the lived experience of taking part as investigators, but also as participants. I am joined by four very special guests, Dr. Rose Gubatosi klug pediatric endocrinologist, professor of pediatrics at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, and the current chair of the DCCT EDIC Research Group. Welcome, Rose. Hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be part of this special podcast commemorating DCCT EDIC. Thanks for being with us, Rose. Then we also have Ms. Gail Lorenzi, RN, CDES, co-chair of the DCCT EDIC Coordinators Committee and Community Health Project Manager based out of the University of California, San Diego. Welcome, Gail. Thank you so much for having us, Alice, and importantly, thank you to ADA for making this all possible. It's a pleasure to be able to share our story. Thanks very much, Gail. And last but most certainly not least, we are joined by Ms. Pamela Curtin and Mr. Bill King, representing arguably the most important people for this entire project, the participants who have dedicated not only their time, but literally their bodies and minds to the pursuit of the truth and the science. Thank you so much for joining us, Pam and Bill. Hi, and thanks for having us. It's such an honor to be here and be invited to represent the entire DCCT participant group. What, what a thrill. Well, it's a real honor to have you here. Thanks so much. So let's get started and let's help set the stage. So let's start with you, Rose. Can you give us a brief historical context of the DCCT and EDIC? I mean, sitting here in 2024, it's obvious that lowering glucose in type 1 diabetes is critical, but that was not always the case, was it? So I guess the question is, you know, why did all of this start in the first place? Oh, I agree with you, Alice. Thinking of patients and medical trainees in our clinics these days, we can confidently discuss the goals and focus on personal diabetes regimens that will optimize care and outcomes. All of this based on the strength of the evidence provided by the DCCT EDIC family, our investigators, coordinators, and as you said, most importantly, 
our participants. But this was not always the case. The stage was really set with the discovery of insulin in 1922. This pioneered a treatment for a previously fatal disease. However, within 15 to 20 years after the initiation of insulin therapy, clinical practices and the medical literature observed and reported the alarming rate and burden of the complications of diabetes. These chronic debilitating complications to the eye, kidney, nerves, as well as the heart became a matter of public health. The question became, what is the therapeutic target to prevent these complications? By the mid-1960s and continuing into the early 1980s, leading scientists debated the biological mechanisms underlying diabetes-related complications. For complications related to the absolute glucose concentrations, meaning was the hyperglycemia accompanying diabetes the trigger for the development of progressive damage to the body? Remember, diabetes management was much more limited with the kinetics of early insulin, frequency and mode of insulin delivery, glucose monitoring methods, all this making physiologic replacement of insulin and maintaining glucose in range much more challenging at those times. Or was there some other non-glucose related effect or mediator of autoimmune diabetes that led to complications? So the debate continued and a National Diabetes Commission was formed by an act of Congress. In 1975, the commission issued the Long Range Plan to Combat Diabetes, which recommended that the National Institutes of Health initiate and support a five-year clinical study to assess the effects of treatment of juvenile onset diabetes on the development of microvascular and macrovascular complications. The treatment to be investigated explored the glucose hypothesis, or as we touched upon, that achieving near normal glucose would prevent or slow the progression of the long-term complications of diabetes. Yet to embark on this trial and to be rigorous and definitive required some advancement in diabetes tools and methods, such as injection and pump regimens to support near normal glucose concentrations guiding patients to self-monitor blood glucose with home devices, and accurate measurement of chronic glycemia with the glycated hemoglobin or hemoglobin A1C assay. Objective standardized measures of early complications, such as lesions to the retinal microvasculature, microalbuminuria screening, and others all had to be developed ahead of the trial starting in 1983. With these advancements, this supported the study design, which ultimately had two treatment arms, the intensive diabetes management arm, or the ability to manage glucose to near normal concentrations with at least three multiple daily injections or pump therapy of insulin, along with four or more blood glucose tests per day, compared to conventional diabetes management, which in the early 1980s primarily included one or two daily injections of insulin and daily monitoring of urine or self-monitoring of blood glucose. Both treatment arms included absence of frequent symptoms of hyperglycemia or frequent or severe hypoglycemia. Thus, the Diabetes Control and Complications Trail started enrollment in 1983 across 21 and then later 29 clinical centers in the United States and Canada with two treatment arms, the intensive and conventional therapy arms, and within each treatment arm, two cohorts of participants, the primary cohort with recent onset of type 1 diabetes and no history of disease to the retina or kidney, and the secondary cohort with type 1 diabetes duration of up to 15 years and evidence of microaneurysm in the retina and an albumin excretion rate as high as 200 milligrams per 24 hours. These two cohorts within each treatment arm allowed full exploration of the glucose hypothesis related to could we, in the primary prevention arm, prevent complications and then in the secondary intervention arm, could we slow the progression of complications? So the DCCT was off and running for what was anticipated to be five years, but which lasted for an average participant follow-up of six years and overall duration, including the recruitment period of 10 years. With this length of follow-up, it was clearly evident that glucose concentrations matter for prevention of early diabetes-related complications, which was the primary trial outcome. The glucose hypothesis was proven with both prevention of diabetic retinopathy in the primary cohort and slowing of diabetic retinopathy progression in the secondary cohort. It's a truly 
practice changing, right? Truly practice changing, game changing. And I mean, sitting here now, we all know that lowering glucose is critical in the management of type 1 diabetes and has a huge impact on complications. And EDIC has shown us that these effects are, in fact, very long lasting. And it was interesting hearing you talk about the stuff that needed to be made beforehand or prepped beforehand. And I've had the pleasure in some of these previous podcast episodes, and I encourage our listeners to go listen to them, to chat with David Nathan as well as David Sachs and, and talking about some of that historical context and even getting the A1C measurement, right, to be consistent and, and able to be used in this absolutely critical trial. So this is historical context is always wonderful to hear. And to have gained all that information, though, the commitment of numerous investigators, including educators, coordinators, researchers, physicians, and of course, the participants was absolutely critical. And before we get to hear from Pam and Bill, let's move now to Gail. So Gail, tell us how and why and when you got involved in DCCT EDIC. And what have you gained from all of this? So we really are going to go back in history a bit um, because I entered into the field of diabetes at the time when one injection a day of regular and NPH and urine testing were the accepted mode of delivery and care. And one of the things that became really very clear in dealing with children and their families who were affected by type 1 diabetes is that this was a true disruption to life for people. And it was a disruption that required much vigilance, but without a lot of guarantees about whether or not it really was going to substantially matter in the long run. And just before that time, I had a brother who was diagnosed with type 1 in his early 20s. And at that time, he was started on exactly that regimen. Fast forward a little bit, and I was given the opportunity to move into a diabetes position in pediatrics that then grew into a research and clinical care position. And it was very clear that while insulin gave us quantity, it did not give quality. And despite the fact that A1Cs and glucose monitoring was starting to become available, it was still tough. And it was still really difficult for people living with diabetes to achieve their goals. So in 1986, when the DCCT expanded to include some additional centers, as Rose mentioned, UC San Diego was added in as a new site. And I moved to San Diego to start the study here in San Diego. And the rest is kind of history. Here I am. At the time I did this, I do need to share with you, just when I moved to San Diego, my mother said to me, you are moving on a grant for 10 years. Do you not know how unstable that is? And I have had to remind her as the decades have passed that that was pretty darn good stability if you have to look at job security, if you will. But this job has been not a job. It has been truly a lifelong passion. It has provided opportunities I never could have dreamed of professionally in terms of all of the growth and development that's been possible and that we hope to engender in all of our staff as they get involved with the study to write manuscripts, to present at meetings, to become community advocates for diabetes. That's kind of the full picture of diabetes. And Alice, you're a great example of that as you sit hosting these podcasts. So as we began the study, we were recruiting individuals that were 13 to 39 years of age. So my pediatric training came in very good stead and has continued to form a wonderful relationship about the foundation for me about the importance of growth and development that goes not only through the children and adolescent years, but it goes all the way through our lives. The study has offered me the opportunity to get a, a perspective into what living with diabetes is like, being with these participants who have opened their heart, they've opened their doors, 
they've opened their their whole beings to allowing us to work side by side with them to learn together to grow together to experience all of the lows and highs not of glucose but of life in general all together and we truly are a research family that's comprised of the investigators the participants and the participants families together this has all happened alone none of this could have happened and i truly am grateful for the participants who i've had the opportunity to live with to work with for nearly 40 years now and to know some of their secrets maybe some of their family members don't know <laughs> and yet to have them feel comfortable enough to share their fears their concerns their triumphs their tragedies and their accomplishments who gets to do that very few people can say that and i am so privileged and honored to be able to say i've been part of this tremendous journey that was absolutely beautiful gail and your your passion is just so clearly evident just listening to you talk about this and one of the things that you said was how important of course the participants are to this journey and none of this would be possible without the dedication of the participants so with that it's a perfect segue to hear from some of the participants of dcct edic and i'm going to start with you bill so bill tell us your story and tell us about the how the why and the when you got involved in this project so if i could go back and you know thank you for again having me on i was diagnosed in 1984 with type 1 diabetes i was working at a hospital going to school and running and dating a nurse who is now my wife ah. <laughs> uh, shortly after being diagnosed my father sent me an article a recruitment ad that was in the newspaper looking for uh, participants in a diabetes study, the DCCT. So I went down to the University of Penn and applied, and they brought me in for interviews and testing. And I was accepted as a, a participant in the experimental group, which was obviously the uh, tightly controlled group. And, you know, I had an advantage that I think I worked at a hospital. I had guidance from there, but also day-by-day -day guidance from my wife, then girlfriend. And when I was entered into the study, I came in with a good understanding of why the study was necessary from a clinical perspective and, you know, what it would take to get me to take more shots instead of the one shot per day to test more frequently, which I was, you know, really wanted to learn how my blood sugar would react to food and exercise and insulin, you know? So for me, I, I just thought it was a gift to be able to gain such insight. Of course, you know, meant going down to the University of Penn once a month, you know, mm -hmm. for more advanced testing. And it was, really just a group effort down there. We would have like an annual holiday party <laughs> with some of the participants getting together with all the researchers and it was great. We really had just a, a long run of great care and great control. My lowest A1C was 6.05, mm -hmm. which I think was the target of the study. You know, I never got below six, but you know, I, I was on MPH and I was started on Humulin insulin because it had just come out shortly, I think, before the study. But I was too sensitive to it at first. So they switched me to beef pork insulin, mm -hmm. which was a little slower in its peak and action. So, yeah, I rolled with that for many years. I had my highs and my lows, you know, but I was actually... I forget where I was when it was announced 
that they were it was at the ADA actually in Denver they announced the conclusion of the DCCT because they had such significant evidence of tighter control reducing the risk of complications and I remember them saying you know it's not the end so just hold tight you know we're hopefully going to get refund it and carry on in following you and I, I was asked to be part of a group from Philadelphia that was interviewed for NIH review to kind of substantiate the refunding of the study, which did take place. And you know, they said, we got you for another 10 years. <laughs> so that was, I guess, 20 years in, they refunded it again and refunded it again, and we're still going. You know, They said, we're never gonna let go of you. So here we are now almost 40 years after the start of the study. It is 40 years, right? The anniversary of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I started on an insulin pump in 1996, which was, I was somewhat resistant to it, you know, being attached, but I realized immediately that it was a, a much better way for me to deliver insulin more accurately in smaller dosing, especially valuable during activity and exercise. So now the technology has advanced so much that I would take it for granted the things we used to have to do to maintain even a modicum of tight control. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know what they're going to discover going forward, but I just hope they continue to support the evidence coming out of the study. Thank you, Bill, for sharing your story and the the commitment, right, of 40 years. And also thank you for talking to the funders and, and making sure that this study uh, was in fact able to to continue. So thank you so much for, for sharing your thoughts there. Now, on to you, Pam. Now, Pam, not only are you a DCCT EDIC participant, but you are also the artist who created the beautiful artwork that graces the cover of this special collection. So Pam, tell us your story. Tell us the how, the why, the when, your involvement in DCCT EDIC and what you have gained from the experience? Sure. So mine was kind of faded. It felt like that anyway. I was sitting on a flight from London, moving back to the cities, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, from London, and I was seated next to Dr. Hollander. And it was a long flight, so of course I had to pull out my insulin. And when she realized I was a type 1 diabetic, she told me about a study that was going to start very soon and how to get in touch with testing out for it. And I followed through after we landed and I got settled. I followed through. I did the preliminary testing and got started as one of the early participants. And I was randomized into the intensive therapy group, which turned out to be a whole lot of work. <laughs> But it's fine because otherwise I felt like I would have been fairly laissez-faire about my diabetes. And this taught me what I needed to know about it. And because I knew so much, I was able to handle things in my life on a daily basis, no matter what came. So after all the years, you know, and starting with no technology, and now we have so much technology, which is wonderful. I just feel more and more confident that I can figure things out on my own. And that's just because of everything involved in doing these studies, knowing my body, and figuring it out after all these years, and feeling so supported along the way because we would test or do things and they'd be explaining why we were doing it, what we were looking for and what we think might happen because of it. So that for me was encouragement enough just to keep doing the multiple tests and multiple shots and all that was involved for so, so long. But I'm relatively complication free. So after all these years, I'm doing really well. It's wonderful. And and one of the things that really strikes me listening to your story and listening to Bill's story, there's a few things. One is 
for the researchers that are listening in terms of recruiting and finding individuals to join a study, Bill's story was a newspaper article that his dad saw, or a newspaper ad, I should say. And then in your case, Pam, it's just, I guess, researcher being observant around them. And you never know. I mean, on an airplane, you might notice somebody and strike up a conversation. But the other thing that struck me listening to both of your stories is that not only is there your desire to help others and, and to advance the science, but that you as participants also gain and learn so much from being part of studies like this. And I think it really reminds researchers of the importance of sharing that information with the participants to really yes. engage them, right? So that they're they're truly a, a part of this project. And I, I've heard the word family already used quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I think that's definitely the feeling I get from this particular project. And then continuing on with you, Pam, I mentioned that you're not only a participant, but you actually created the beautiful artwork that's on the cover of this issue of Diabetes Care. So tell us more. I did. So the bird that we chose, because I do lots of birds, was pine grosbeak. And it came about just because of an, another aha moment. And I live in Minnesota and about 2005 or six. It was a really bitter winter and it was cold and snowy and I was sketching all the birds at my feeder through the window and I kept thinking, gosh, you guys stick around and it's a shame you're not like super flamboyant like in the South and I just wanted to honor them. And so I, in a heartbeat, I knew how I would do it and I would create an ink sketch. I used to be a fashion illustrator way, way back. And we always had to do things for the paper and ink. So I always sketch an ink. And I had a collection of textiles and embroidery, et cetera, that I had scanned in. So I sketched the birds realistically. And then I used all these patterns and textiles for the palette to color them in. So from a distance, they might look, resemble realistically. But when you get close, then you see all the whimsical things that are inside. And so they just have taken off. And now I've done several, several groups of birds and chickens and hawks and owls, you name it. But the pine girl speak, he was one of my first backyard birds group. So we settled on him. That's wonderful. And it truly is a beautiful piece of artwork. And I encourage everyone to enjoy it on the cover of this month's issue. Now back to you, Rose. When did you get involved in DCCT EDIC? And can you tell us more about the process by which decisions are made on what data EDIC collects and what questions are answered? Because there have been lots of data and lots of answers that have come out and there's continues to be more questions being asked. So how does all of that happen? So my opportunity to join the DCCT EDIC family came in 2007. Dr. Saul Ganuth, the original co-chair of the DCCT EDIC study from the beginning in 1983, and my colleague and mentor at Case Western Reserve University, along with Dr. Bill Doms, the DCCT EDIC site investigator here at Case Western, had designed the DCCT EDIC study to have two coordinating centers, one focused on the support of the clinical site, and that was focused here at Case Western Reserve University, and one that focused on the data gathering and analyses which is at the George Washington University. So 2007 was a time of transition as the current PI of the Clinical Coordinating Center, Dr. Mark Palmert, was taking a new position at the University of Toronto. So after meeting with Dr. Canoes on several occasions, as well as other EDIC leaders, including Drs. David Nathan, Bernie Zinman, and John McKean, so it was a long interview process, but a lot of fun. Everyone was so engaged in the EDIC mission that Dr. Gnuth asked me, why don't you join EDIC and lead the clinical coordinating center? And I thought, I can't turn him down. Of course I had to say yes. So I, I've always felt very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time as well. Like so many, my family had a personal connection with diabetes and its complications. So appreciating the magnitude of DCCT EDIC and this incredible opportunity to contribute to the study I just had to say yes. So I always consider myself the luckiest assistant professor in pediatric endocrinology. 
in determining what questions we ask in EDIC and what data we collect, there are many processes involved and avenues for collaboration. First, the core EDIC protocol is updated every 10 years, as Bill said in the beginning, and now every five years. New scientific aims and objectives are determined by the investigators across the now 27 EDIC sites. With the rich longitudinal database and still over a thousand participants seen each year, we continue to identify additional risk factors beyond glucose that impact the development of the core microvascular and macrovascular complications of diabetes while continuing many of the original standardized outcome assessments and questionnaires. We always consider how can we further impact guidelines, what additional assessments are important across the lifespan of individuals living with type 1 diabetes. We really start about three years before the next cycle, meeting internally, and then we invite external collaborators who are all experts in subject matter that we wish to pursue. This generates a comprehensive list from which we determine the most compelling science in balance with participant and staff burden. We know we cannot do it all, although we always try, and we tend to never do anything just once. I think Bill and Pam will agree, we, we recognize our strengths is in detailed longitudinal follow-up. So it's through consensus voting and feedback from the investigators and the entire study group that we move ahead with any new assessments in the next cycle. As well, we keep an open dialogue with our participants through newsletters. We ask them what keeps them coming back and they tell us it's the cutting edge test that they wouldn't be involved in otherwise clinically, the ability to help others and the incredible connection with Gail and all of our local teams at the EDIC site. We always keep their sentiments, these aspects in mind. Second, DCCT EDIC investigators and even external scientists prepare applications for what we call ancillary studies that add to our core aims and objectives and broaden our scientific reach. These ancillary studies are reviewed by our internal research review committee and then presented to the entire study group for consideration. DCCT EDIC has long appreciated that the coordinators like Gail have important relationships with our participants and are essential to this process. They provide the critical voice of what they feel the participant will enjoy versus finding too burdensome. If the study group approves an ancillary study application and independent funding is secured, then we weave these ancillary studies into our current grant cycle. We are always looking for investigations that require our unique cohort and that we believe can be answered definitively. And then finally, third, for the past 40 plus years, the DCCT edict has sent phenotypic data and biologic samples to the NIDDK repository. It's just an incredible resource to the greater scientific research community. So I encourage all of your listeners to reach out. Requests for use of the DCCT edict data and samples can be submitted right on the NIDDK website. Incredible. Detailed, rigorous protocol processes to really learn as much as we can, right? from the data that are, in fact, collected. Thank you so much, Rose, for, for sharing that. And it has been 40 years, which is incredible. And to acknowledge this, Gail, you spearheaded an initiative to commemorate and summarize the practice-changing data that have emerged from 40 years of information. So, Gail, tell us a bit more about this initiative. Well, as I mentioned before, this is really a, a research family. And in any day-to-day -day life, we all celebrate things like birth dates and anniversaries and things that are milestones within life. And the milestones that the research group and participants have all achieved over the course of time have been similarly recognized. And so at the end of the DCCT, this is taking us back in time, the participants and research group were awarded the Charles E. Best Medal for distinguished service in the field of diabetes. And so all of the participants and staff alike received a certificate, which basically awarded the study that medal, which was pretty awesome. And, you know, through the years, we have continued to recognize the different milestones the participants have met. And so at the 30 year milestone, 
we had a symposium at the scientific sessions, a series of journal articles dedicated to the DCCT edict at that time. And we created a 30-year symposium book, which basically started from the time of, as Rose took you back through the history, to when the participants were first randomized, all the way through all the tests that had been done and all of the results that had been achieved as a result of their work. So it seemed only fitting to equally, and with a little bit more oomph, recognize the 40th anniversary because we're still doing it and we're still all together as this research family. So all of our participants have received a certificate for 40 years from the NIDDK, who's the funding agency for the study. We were able to secure fleece jackets for them with the logo on it that says 40th anniversary. And we then reached out to the participants and said, we're going to be putting together a book that gets you up to speed for the last 10 years. And if any of you would like to share your thoughts or sentiments about what it has been like to participate in this study over the course of time or what it has meant to you. Well, over 225 people responded back with sentiments that were heartwarming, touching, brought you to tears, and made you, with each one of those, realize that, oh my goodness, we have made a difference, and we are continuing to make a difference in the lives of so many people who are living with type 1 diabetes and their families. So each of these participants that contributed brought their personal and unique perspective, and those are all captured in this 40th year book for the participants all to be able to see what it was like for their peers that are in the study and to see if they contributed to also see their sentiment put in real life, if you will. So we will be giving them that sometime this fall. It is under production currently. In addition, the ADA through Diabetes Care has invited several articles to be published that represent unique and new data from the DCCT edict in the September issue. And that will have also commentary from the director of the NIDDK, as well as an editorial that will speak not only to the research group, but very specifically call out the participants like Bill and Pamela, who have dedicated so much of their lives, bodies and souls to this study. And there will be a link in there for the readers of Diabetes Care to be able to link to this as well. And it's all de-identified. And so everybody is in there from the perspective of speaking from their hearts, not necessarily with their name on it, but you will get to see, as will everyone, what it has been like to work within this study, to live within this research family, and to achieve what we've all been able to achieve together. Wow, that sounds amazing. Very amazing. And it's like a 40 year yearbook. And then I think is what are you going to do for 50 years, right? You're going to need to start planning now, Gail, for what are you going to do for 50? It's been amazing things for each decade so far. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned that in this September issue, there are the five new analyses which are being published. And, and in fact, following this interview that we are having, my co-host for this podcast, Dr. Mike Rickles, will be speaking with authors to discuss those five new analyses from EDIC that are published in the special collection in Diabetes Care. And to help set the stage for that one, Rose, I'm going to turn back to you and I'm going to give you a special challenge of trying to briefly summarize what we've learned in 40 years <laughs> and perhaps ending off with a quick preview of the questions that will be answered in the studies in this issue that Mike will be addressing further in his interview. So following the DCCT, many of these loyal DCCT participants transitioned to the long-term follow-up in EDIC with cumulative DCCT EDIC participation, as you said, of over four decades which is just simply remarkable. So with more follow-up time, we have observed the beneficial effects of intensive therapy 
on all of the traditional microvascular complications, and then even the more advanced complications such as cardiovascular disease and even mortality. Moreover, the results of the DCCT and the description during edict of metabolic memory or the long lasting beneficial effects of intensive therapy has forever impacted clinical care guidelines. And it remains the recommendation to initiate intensive diabetes management at the time of diagnosis or as early as safely possible. And so I think the summary is that the DCCT edict story is a, is a message of hope. And it's certainly the one that I tell on a daily basis to children newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and their family. As we move forward, our focus remains on understanding healthy aging and type 1 diabetes. So in preparing the 40th anniversary articles, we selected our most recent findings and highlighted the diversity of DCCT edicts investigations of diabetes-related complications starting where the trial started preserving vision, which is critical to quality of life. We asked using more modern technology, ocular coherence tomography, which is in most ophthalmology clinics these days, what is the impact of diabetes management on structural changes in the retina? With focus on the nerve layers compared to the traditional vasculature. How do these structural changes associate with the history of vascular surgery, and what can they tell us about the potential loss of vision now and, and will continue to follow in the future. The second article is really looking at improving quality of life and bringing awareness to neuropathic pain. So what is the incidence, prevalence, and risk factors of neuropathic pain in type 1 diabetes with and without clinical signs of diabetic peripheral neuropathy, certainly a challenge for many, many patients. We also turn to diabetic kidney disease and look more at mechanisms. We look at what biomarkers measured over time using all our stored samples best associate with incident macroalbuminuria and sustained decline in EGFR. What potential new therapeutic targets are suggested here that we might be able to develop into novel therapies to further reduce the incidence of diabetic kidney disease. A newer area for us, bone formation, but really important as we all age, what do diabetes and its complications tell us about how your bone is formed, the microarchitecture we call it, and bone strength? Are there diabetes management or specific complications? to correlate with an individual's bone strength and their future for falls and fractures. And then finally, we have taken a real focus on the brain and cognition, something that everyone worries about as they age and certainly young families and our participants worry about as well. So we started looking again at how do these known plasma biomarkers of brain injury that have been studied in other cohorts, how do they associate with neuroimaging and cognitive assessments in adults with long-term type 1 diabetes? With this study and future studies, we hope to address the question of diabetes and accelerate aging and Alzheimer's disease in type 1 diabetes. Thank you, Rose. And I encourage all our listeners to stay tuned for the next interview to learn about what was in fact found in all of those studies. So to close out this first interview, I, I want to end off with Pamela and Bill. Any words that you want to share to the DCCT EDIC team and to our listeners as well? And perhaps we can uh, start with you, Pamela. Concerning the study, after all these years, I would just love to shout out to my clinic at the IDC, Dr. Bergestahl, Mary, and Leanne who have become part of my family over all these years. And they've just been a very important part of my life. And I'm doing so well after 53 years of diabetes because of them and because of DCCT and the EDIC study, everything I've learned from it. And it's given me the confidence to handle whatever comes every day. And it's all been worth it. Wonderful. Thank you, Pamela. And Bill? 
I would just like to recognize the fact that, you know, the study started with 1,441 participants. And I don't know what the current participant count is today, but I know it's over 90% follow-up participation. It's it's unprecedented, I think, in clinical research. Maybe one other study of nurses up in Massachusetts <laughs> had that high level of participation, but I think it speaks volumes for all the work that has gone into recruit the scientific side and the clinical approach to the study and all the impact that it's had, not only on the treatment of diabetes, but the participants themselves. You know, I could vouch for that. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to Dr. Rose Gubatosi Klug, Ms. Gail Lorenzi, Ms. Pamela Curtin, Mr. Bill King, not only for spending time with us to share your experiences and expertise, but for your commitment and sacrifices that have taught all of us so very, very much and has truly impacted literally the lives of millions of people. And to our listeners, please stay tuned for our next interview discussing some of the new findings from EDIC, the gift that keeps on giving. In the September 2024 issue of Diabetes Care, there's a special collection of five papers from the DCCT EDIC study. While a familiar acronym, DCCT stands for the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial of Intensive versus Conventional Glycemic Control in Type 1 Diabetes. And EDIC stands for Epidemiology of Diabetes Interventions and Complications that has followed the DCCT study participants for the last 30 years since the intervention trial completed in 1994. With us to discuss the latest findings from the EDIC study are Drs. Barbara Flody, the Matthew D. Davis Professor in Ophthalmology at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, Dr. Christine Lamonte, Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Nephrology, at the University of Washington in Seattle, Dr. Rodika Papasui, Professor of Medicine and Head of Endocrinology at the Oregon Health Science University in Portland, and Dr. Nina Sinha Gregory, Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine in the Division of Endocrinology at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York City. Welcome and thank you all for agreeing to be part of this special podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Happy to be here. Yes, thanks so much for having us all on. Thank you, Mike. Always a pleasure to be part of such an esteemed panel. Well, thank you all. And Barbara, let's start with you. One of the main benefits of intensive glycemic control, as demonstrated by the DCCT, is a prevention of both the incidence and progression of diabetic retinopathy. In the September issue, is a study you led utilizing ocular coherence tomography, or OCT, in EDIC study participants. Can you please tell us how OCT works as an imaging modality for the retina, how it compares to fundus photography, and what new insights were gained from your current analysis? Thank you for that great question. OCT has been a big change in how we practice ophthalmology and especially retina especially for patients with diabetic retinopathy and edema. It is a new way of viewing the retina. A fundus photograph is really like there's a drone inside your eye getting an overview of the whole retina surface. The OCT, which is a laser interferometer, and I can explain that in a minute, allows us to section the retina as if we were histologists. We can see the layers of the retina from the inner to the outer retinal layers. So this laser interferometer was quite an amazing discovery. That was in the early 2000s, and we've had it getting better and better, so improved versions of OCT. And it allows us to see all 10 layers of the retina, which is really quite remarkable. We can measure those layers. We can see if they're missing or disrupted. It's, in fact, such a big 
change in how we practice ophthalmology that the three men who developed this are one, the 2023 Lasker DeBakey Clinical Medical Research Award. So they realized the award committee that this was not just a big step for ophthalmology, but really for the care of patients with many medical conditions. And it had not been used in the DCCT edict study up until this last cycle. It allows us, in addition to the photos, where we can see if there's changes such as hemorrhage or neovascularization, it allows us to see structural changes within basically 5 to 10 micron resolution. The changes that we're looking for on OCT is, first of all, to determine whether the retinal layers are normal. Are they all visible? Are they missing? Are they disrupted? What's going on? Are they too thin or too thick? The second thing that we're looking at, and this is done every day in a retina practice, is to look at the thickness of the retina. And in patients with diabetes, both type 1 and type 2, edema can form. So edema is the retinal capillaries can leak, leading to thickening of the retina. That happens most typically in the center of the retina where your central vision is. And so that's a primary cause of vision loss, edema. We can't see edema very well on a photograph. It's, again, just this aerial view, the topographic map, but the OCT lets us look inside. So the founders, again, that developed this had understanding of ophthalmology and having OCT adds to our understanding of diabetic retinopathy hasn't changed the way we assess the color photographs, but it gives us new insights because we can see both disruption of the normal retina as well as the swelling that can occur, the edema. So, and that just is fascinating to me and just an incredible new lens, if you will, into the layering of the retina and this ability to see edema within that retinal tissue long before it becomes visible to conventional methods of fundoscopy just seems like a, a really important advance for how we can monitor and identify diabetic retinopathy in our patients. If I can add one little bit, which is to say that it was perfect timing because it came at a time where we had treatment for diabetic macular edema that was game changing. So now we can identify the edema, just as you said, because then we can treat it and we treat with injections into the eye of an antivascular endothelial growth factor medication that works remarkably well. So, you know, a new imaging paired with new treatment was a pretty big step forward. Well, that's wonderful. And turning to you now, Christine, the DCCT also demonstrated a reduction in the incidence and progression of diabetic nephropathy with intensive glycemic control. However, it's difficult in clinical practice to differentiate glomerular from tubular interstitial mechanisms of renal injury that contribute to progression of diabetic kidney disease. You led a study evaluating renal tubular biomarkers in the DCCT edict cohort. Can you please explain what these tubular biomarkers are measuring that distinguishes them from measures of albuminuria and estimated glomerular filtration rate? and what you learned from your analysis of the DCCT EDIC participants? Well, as you implied, Mike, diabetic nephropathy has traditionally been viewed as a glomerular disease process. And indeed, the classic glomerular lesions like mesangial expansion and chemo steel wilson nodules are some of the more prominent features seen in kidney biopsies of people with diabetic nephropathy. However, there's also significant tubular pathology, which hasn't been as well studied or characterized. Clinically, albuminuria, which is a hallmark of diabetic nephropathy, reflects glomerular disease. On the other hand, reduced glomerular filtration rate, GFR, is nonspecific and can result from either glomerular or tubular interstitial damage. Currently, assessing the health of kidney tubules is not a standard part of clinical practice. But with the identification of tubular biomarkers, which specifically indicate tubular injury and dysfunction, 
we now have the tools to better study tubular pathology in diabetes. What we did was take a set of tubular biomarkers, KIM-1 and soluble TNFR1 in plasma, MCP1, EGF in urine, and a composite of eight proximal tubular secreted solutes, and measure these at seven time points spanning 30 years in the DCCT EDIC cohort. We found that kidney tubular biomarkers worsened over time, suggesting that tubular pathology occurs early in the course of diabetic kidney disease, when albuminuria and GFR are in the normal range. We also examined associations of tubular biomarkers with adverse kidney outcomes. And we found that tubular biomarkers, in particular KIM-1 and STNFR1, were associated with incident macroalbuminuria and sustained of low EGFR. Specifically, increases in these biomarkers were apparent before rise in albuminuria or decline in GFR were observed. These findings suggest that tubular biomarkers may be able to identify kidney disease in diabetes earlier than our traditional glomerular markers. Wow, Christine. So here's another example, like we just heard for retinopathy, now turning to nephropathy, where there is new tools to look at earlier indications of damage caused by diabetes. And always wondered about those patients who never presented with albuminuria, but they develop a decline in EGFR. And how now we have a way of identifying those individuals earlier in their disease process where we have an opportunity to intervene, like in the eye, and now with increasing number of renal protective medications available, seems like also a key opportune moment for developing tools to identify tubular injury early when we might have a chance to intervene and change the progression of the disease process. That's exactly right. And to your point, Mike, there had been this, you know, presentation of diabetic nephropathy that was recognized over the years as not having albuminuria. And it was always attributed to vascular disease. And what we're learning now is that this may be, in addition to vascular disease, tubular interstitial disease. And with the advent of drugs like SGLT2 inhibitors that target the proximal tubule, we may have therapies that address this specific aspect of kidney pathology. That's just amazing. Now, let's turn to you, Rodika. Diabetic peripheral neuropathy is the third microvascular complication that was also reduced with intensive treatment in the DCCT. You led a study examining the relationship between neuropathic pain and clinical signs of diabetic peripheral neuropathy in the DCCT EDIC study. Can you please tell us how neuropathic pain and clinical diabetic peripheral neuropathy were each determined in your study and how these measures were related over time in this cohort? Absolutely, Mike. And I just like by stopping by saying that DCCT EDIC, it's perhaps the only, you know, cohort of people with diabetes that has only also included quite comprehensive measures of neuropathy that have been systematically obtained over time. In general, neuropathy is, you know, more like an orphan complication as majority of large clinical trials are concentrating on cardiovascular, kidney, or eye complications. But in DCCT and then in EDIC, we have been fortunate to obtain over time the entire battery of peripheral neuropathic evaluations, including electrophysiology, and symptoms and sign as well of autonomic neuropathy evaluations. Particularly for this paper, what is remarkable is because we had the opportunity to obtain such comprehensive measures, we also could validate a clinical instrument, which is the Michigan Neuropathy Screening Instrument that has two components, a clinical examination as well as a patient-reported symptom questionnaire by comparing with the gold standard that includes the entire battery of electrophysiology. And we have demonstrated that it is indeed a highly sensitive and specific instrument that has the luxury of being much easier applied in large cohort. And we had 
the opportunity to use the Michigan Neuropathy Screening Instrument every single year since we started EDIC so for more than 30 years now. The symptom questionnaire in the MNSI or the Michigan Neuropathy Screening Instrument has also two questions that are highly specific for neuropathic pain, which has this very clear characteristic of burning pain. And those questions are like, do you ever had any burning pain in your legs or feet? As well as, does it hurt when the clothes or bed covers touch your skin? This is also very typical neuropathic pain, like this hyper algesia and allodynia. And more recently, our colleagues in the UK Biobank, in fact, were able to demonstrate that these two questions are highly specific for neuropathic pain. So this is how we evaluated clinical neuropathy as well as neuropathic pain. It's also important to understand that peripheral neuropathy has a very broad spectrum of manifestation just because the peripheral nervous system anatomy is very complex with various type of nerve fibers that carry different nerves and functions with the smallest unmyelinated fibers being responsible for this neuropathic pain. And up until now, we never had the opportunity to study specifically neuropathic pain in EDIC. We did evaluate neuropathy over time. We did demonstrate that indeed glucose control significantly prevents the development of neuropathy and also has an effect with respect to metabolic memory, but we did not have the opportunity to look at neuropathic pain until now. And why is this relevant? Well, it's relevant because we know that neuropathic pain, it's extremely challenging to treat. In fact, in US and many other countries, we are facing this opioid epidemic because unfortunately, still to date, primary care physicians that provide care to people with diabetes may select opioid as a first line of treatment to neuropathic pain when in reality they are irrelevant for neuropathic pain. But with our data, we identified also the type of patients who are more likely to develop this small fiber neuropathy, in other words, neuropathic pain associated with diabetic neuropathy. And we also have been able to show that when a person develops neuropathy, it's not necessarily the, the same person that may develop loss of sensation and, you know, for instance, numbness will also develop the pain. And those are additional informations that can be embedded now in educational material that can be used at the point of care. We have also demonstrated that that intensive glucose control applied early in the course of type 1 diabetes does have a protective effect in preventing neuropathic pain, which is an important information to be shared with, with our patients. So important because the pain our patients experience with diabetic neuropathy really is and can be so debilitating. And really, their primary chief complaint in regards to effects of neuropathy. And it's so important how you bring up the, there can be a disconnection between evidence of sensory or motor neuropathy and the painful sensory neuropathy that can be such a challenge to treat. And hopefully with this improved method for determining the presence of painful neuropathy, that that can help steer targeted inter interventions that are more appropriate and more helpful for our patients. I think another important point I would like to make, Mike, is that because we had the opportunity to study that over such a long period of time using the same instrument, that also enabled us to understand that, in fact, not everybody that develops pain will have persistent pain. And in many instances, the pain resolves despite using or not pain medication. And I think that that's another important information to be conveyed to clinicians who take care of these patients, because just giving pain medication may be not necessarily a step. If other risk factors are controlled, the pain may resolve, and that could also help to curb this pain medication epidemic, particularly in the fight against opioid. And Rodika, there's 
an additional article in this collection that assessed plasma biomarkers of brain injury in the EDIC cohort. Can you tell us about what insights this study provides about how decades of type 1 diabetes can affect brain structure and cognition? Oh, absolutely. And I have to say that Again, the CCT EDIC had an opportunity to study cognition for several cycles, with the most recent one when we had the opportunity to do again a complex battery of cognitive tests as well as brain MRIs, and then study selective biomarkers to try to understand whether the cognitive dysfunction that appears in diabetes, including in type 1 diabetes, may have a more Alzheimer disease-like pattern or a more nonspecific neuroinflammatory pattern. And hence, we therefore used several of these biomarkers, including the phosphorylated tau and these amyloid 42 over 40 ratios, which are you know, recognized patterns that would suggest more of an AD type of cognitive impairment versus the neurofilament light chain that is a more generalized neuroinflammatory marker. And what we have found in our cohort that although there were significant associations with phosphorylated tau-181, as well as with neurofilament light chain, which were also highly associated with not only with aging, but with also higher A1C levels, there were no associations with amyloid beta measures, including this ratio of amyloid beta 42 over 40 ratio, which actually suggests that the markers of cognitive dysfunction, the markers of MRI findings, and the biomarkers patterns that we observed do not suggest that in our cohort, the cognitive dysfunction is associated with an AD type pattern, but more generalized neuroinflammatory pattern. And I think many of us would probably find that reassuring that there is, again, a targeted change associated with the diabetes, in this case, the neuroinflammation that could be approach with glycemic control, for example, and decreases in potentially glucose variability or other interventions that over a lifetime with type 1 diabetes can serve to decrease and protect from cognitive decline that has been associated with diabetes and to not be sort of fear to be resulting in an Alzheimer's disease type picture that, that can't be changed. So I think it's, again, great how these biomarkers are getting at defining more specifically changes in, in end organs that are affected by diabetes and the mechanism by which diabetes itself is doing so. So, Nina, turning to you now, you led a study that assessed bone microarchitecture by high-resolution peripheral quantitative computed tomography. What does this analysis teach us about skeletal quality for those individuals with long-standing type 1 diabetes? So thank you so much, Mike. There has been increasing evidence that type 1 diabetes has a deleterious impact on bone health. And this includes a marked increase in fracture risk, which is five times a greater risk in hip fractures in those with type 1 diabetes versus those without. Now, the current standard to determine if someone is at risk for fracture is a bone density scan, which is a two-dimensional image. Those with type 1 diabetes do have a modest decrease in bone density, but this modest decrease does not account for this exaggerated fracture risk. So this suggests that there are other factors other than bone density that are influencing bone strength including factors like bone geometry and microarchitecture. So we have a research tool that can give high resolution pictures of actual three-dimensional microarchitecture of the bone using a CT of peripheral sites, the wrist and the lower leg. And this tool can also predict fracture risk. 
So when this type of test was performed on those with type 1 diabetes and those without, we found that those with type 1 diabetes had lower bone density, larger area, and poorer microarchitecture. But the estimated fracture risk in these two populations was the same. So this then led us to examine how could we predict who within the type 1 group is at risk for fracture. And we found that there were certain risk factors associated with poorer microarchitecture. And these included suboptimal glycemic control and those with microvascular complications that we've heard about from our previous speakers, including kidney disease, neuropathy, and retinopathy. So these results point to the possible benefits of addressing these risk factors to preserve bone density and to decrease fracture risk. These are pointing to be excellent areas for future research. But I also want to highlight how unique this population of participants is. They are now at the age where skeletal health can be screened for. So we used to think of osteoporosis as a normal process of aging, but we now know that it can be preventable and treatable and that the risk of fracture can be dramatically decreased with a variety of available treatment options. So for example, type 1 diabetes is associated with low rates of bone formation, and we now have osteoporosis medications that actually target this and can improve it tremendously and markedly decrease the fracture risk. So we have to make sure that this increased fracture risk is more widely known and appreciated so that patients are screened earlier and treatment is started when needed and not delayed. So the prevention of fracture is critical as fractures, especially hip fractures, are associated with significant morbidity and mortality. That's great, Nina. And just another example for how we're getting a much clearer understanding of the disease process that can affect organs, in this case now the skeleton, in individuals with longstanding diabetes that's different from what we associate with more common age-related declines, say in this case osteoporosis. And so treating individuals with decades of type 1 diabetes will need to be different than how we treat other individuals of comparable age presenting with fracture, hopefully, who we can identify prior to their first experience of a fracture and intervene and start making an impact on that enormously increased fracture risk that you stated for individuals with diabetes. So I'd like to come back to Barbara and Christine for a moment and and ask you each now as an ophthalmologist and nephrologist to reflect on recent findings from the EDIC study and how they may shape future clinical practice for screening and monitoring of diabetic eye and kidney disease. Thank you for this question, Michael. It's really important what we've learned from this study because of the structural changes we see on OCT. One of the important structural biomarkers we see is damage and disruption of the inner layers of the retina. We call that drill. And in fact, it was Dr. Jenny Sun at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center who described this finding, as well as Lloyd Aiello, the principal investigator on the ophthalmology side, who described this and published this biomarker that we saw more commonly, much more frequently in the patients with conventional treatment versus those that were in the intensive treated group. There weren't many patients with active edema, but what this structural biomarker represents is that they had edema sometime in the past. Because this was the first cycle we could do this imaging test, the OCT, we don't have follow-up yet, but it is important for all ophthalmologists to know that this disruption on OCT, which is in every office, is meaningful change. It's also now incorporated into screening of patients in the internist's office or hopefully in the pharmacies or around the country where we can screen patients for diabetic retinopathy with a digital camera, but also with this OCT. So those two are the really forefront of what we need for screening patients for diabetic retinopathy. 
and really the study is amazing to me because the DCT with its longitudinal nature has given us so much information. And I also appreciate all the knowledge of the specialists in, in diabetes care. One of the important things I learned is that when we look at covariates, when we look at all the variables we can think of in the eye, we look at the demographic data, we look at the medical history. In this case, for the eye, for the OCT changes, hemoglobin A1C did not make a difference. Most of the hypertension, cardiovascular disease did not make a difference, but the GFR did, it was correlated with retinal disease. So worsening retinal disease with decreasing GFR and I think that's fascinating. I don't have an answer for that. So maybe Christine can help. With respect to kidney disease, our findings from the DCCT edict show that certain tubular biomarkers, specifically blood KIM1 and STNFR1, are associated with long-term kidney disease progression. By regularly measuring these biomarkers in clinical settings, we may be able to better identify people who are at a higher risk for progressive kidney disease and who may benefit from earlier initiation of treatment and closer follow-up. So really looking ahead, thinking in terms of screening and monitoring, it's possible that these tubular biomarkers will become an important part of how we perceive diabetic kidney disease and how we screen and monitor for it. That's terrific. And Rodika, Nina, as endocrinologists caring for individuals with type 1 diabetes, any final words or takeaway messages? Yes, thank you, Mike. First of all, what I like to say is that we are so grateful to the DCCT EDIC participants who have actually have enabled us to learn unparalleled lessons regarding the natural history of type 1 diabetes in general and enable us to identify various phenotypes of patients who may or may not develop a given complication enable us to understand that treating type 1 diabetes is not using a size fits all and enable us to become closer and closer to apply a personalized type of medicine which is the future of treating any person in general but particularly person with such a challenging chronic disease like diabetes and type 1 diabetes. I, you know, I recall with pride last year the American Diabetes Association scientific session in San Diego when he celebrated 40 years of the CCT edict, and we had the privilege of having many of our participants there in the room. It was perhaps one of the most emotional moments because the CCT edict is in fact the catalyst that has spearheaded all this discovery of new medications, new technologies, new, you know, strategies of treating diabetes in general. Because DCCT EDIC has demonstrated that intensive glucose control can effectively prevent all this complication, enable all these new companies and pharma partners to concentrate their effort in finding new therapies and new technologies. So that's something that we should always have in mind. And identifying these biomarkers, whether there are biomarkers that one can check in a blood test or urine, or measuring a new biomarker in the retina, or measuring a new clinical biomarkers that may be relevant to neurological complications, whether they are peripheral or central. In fact, it's becoming closer and closer to be applied at the point of care. Again, will benefit all people with type 1 diabetes that are now seen, and this is really remarkable. So I have no words to thank our participants and all our DCCT edic colleagues that have made this finding possible. I would also just like to tremendously echo what Rodika has just said and to say what an honor and privilege it has been to take care and be part of this study over the many years. I think we now do have enough evidence to have determined that patients with type 1 diabetes really should be screened for skeletal health at the age of 50. So currently, when we talk about the screening recommendations, it's really women at age 65 or men at age 70 
or people younger between the ages of 50 to 64 if they have a risk factor. And diabetes is not currently one of those risk factors that is that well known. So I was happy to be able to contribute to that knowledge and that to really be advocating for that to now be one of those risk factors. The current risk factors, you know, are things like a family history of osteoporosis or excessive alcohol intake, things like prednisone, malabsorptive surgery. But I do think now that we do have enough data that diabetes should be in that category so that we should be screening our patients at the age of 50 because of the marked increased risk of fracture. And it's just so important what you've all pointed out that we've learned so much from this dedicated group of individuals with type 1 diabetes who have devoted so much time, energy, and this commitment over the years to teaching the world about type 1 diabetes and its effects and how we can both improve on outcomes and develop newer, better, more sophisticated tools to identify problems early and assess the effect of our interventions to make the lives of countless others affected with type 1 diabetes around the world and in the future improved by a pure gift that the DCCP edict participants have given to the world. I want to thank you, Drs. Barbara Blody, Christine Lamonte, Rodika Pop Basui, and Nina Sinha Gregory for joining us today and discussing this very special collection of DCCT edict papers. It's just amazing to see all the additional science that continues to come from this group of dedicated individuals, both the participants and the investigators and their teams of coordinators. I'm most appreciative for your valuable insights and encourage our listeners to access the full papers in the September 2024 issue of Diabetes Care. Let's move on now to our rapid exchange segment, where Mike and I chat about some of the articles we found particularly interesting this month. Mike, what was your first pick? Alice, I'll start us off with a study examining the real-world effect of continuing versus discontinuing metformin therapy during pregnancy among women with pregestational type 2 diabetes being treated with both metformin and insulin. Dr. Jennifer Island from Boston University, Massachusetts, and colleagues examine both public and commercial healthcare claims databases for pregnancy outcomes among almost 3,000 women with type 2 diabetes being treated with metformin and insulin at conception. Among these women, 28% continued and 72% discontinued use of metformin during pregnancy. The primary composite outcome of possible birth complications was no different between women continuing versus discontinuing metformin. There was also no difference in the risk for all secondary outcomes except for small for gestational age, where risk was increased about twofold with metformin continuation among those commercially but not publicly insured. These findings provide additional reassurance for the overall safety of metformin use during pregnancy, but do point to a possible risk for affecting fetal growth that requires further investigation. And Mike, we've certainly been using metformin in the pregnancy clinic for quite some time now. And these data are reassuring and consistent with what was seen in the randomized controlled MITEI study. So therefore, I think it's always nice when the real world data or the observational data certainly have consistency. So continuing along with the pregnancy theme, my first pick is looking at a question that definitely comes up in diabetes and pregnancy clinic. The question is, what is the association between glycemic levels during pregnancy and long-term offspring risk of cardiometabolic as well as neurobehavioral disorders. To answer this, Dr. Denise Fagg and colleagues from the University of Toronto conducted a population-based cohort study of deliveries in the province of Ontario in Canada between 1991 and 2018. 
Nearly 3.5 million mother-infant pairs were followed up to 29 years. They showed that offspring of women with type 1 diabetes had the highest risk of ADHD with an adjusted hazard ratio of 1.43, autism spectrum disorder with an adjusted hazard ratio of 1.94, diabetes with an adjusted hazard ratio of 4.73, hypertension was increased as was cardiovascular disease. The next higher risk group were offspring of women with type 2 diabetes, followed by those uh, women with gestational diabetes. Now, among those with pre-existing diabetes, there was an association between pregnancy A1C and offspring diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease, but no statistical association with neurobehavioral outcomes. This tells us that in utero exposure to maternal diabetes is associated with increased risk in the offspring, but that pregnancy glycemia can impact offspring cardiometabolic outcomes, but not neurobehavioral outcomes. So another reason to maintain glycemic goals as much as possible during pregnancy, thinking about the future of that child from a cardiometabolic perspective. Absolutely, Alice. And when possible, preconception planning to achieve glycemic goals early might help to narrow the risk gap observed here between those with pregestational diabetes and those with gestational diabetes developing during pregnancy. My next pick is a post hoc analysis of the award PEED study that randomized youth with type 2 diabetes to treatment with the GLP-1 agonist dilaglutide or placebo. Dr. Peter Bjornstad from the University of Colorado in Aurora and colleagues examined changes in estimated glomerular filtration rate and albuminuria in 154 youth ages 10 to 18 years. Those assigned to dilaglutide demonstrated attenuated glomerular hyperfiltration and albuminuria after 26 weeks intervention compared to those receiving placebo. These results support a potential protective effect on the kidney from dilaglutide in youth, as has been demonstrated already for adults with type 2 diabetes. Further work is warranted to assess the long-term impact of such early intervention with GLP-1 agonists in youth onset type 2 diabetes. And GLP-1 receptor therapy is already a cornerstone of treatment for adults living with type 2 diabetes for their outcome reduction properties. And that list seems to keep growing in terms of what they're able to do. So it's wonderful to see data like these that support benefits even in youth with type 2 diabetes. So thank you very much for sharing that. My next pick carries along the theme of medication for type 2 diabetes and the concept of choosing wisely. Dr. Carl Johansson and colleagues from the University of Copenhagen in Denmark conducted a study to describe the trends over time in the balance between pharmacotherapy benefits, such as mortality and diabetes-related outcomes reductions, adverse events, and medication costs in a Danish population with type 2 diabetes from 2002 to 2020. The study included over 461,000 individuals and between 2002 to 2020, the overall incidence of cardiovascular, renal, and other important adverse clinical outcomes decreased. Yay, means we're doing something. Only infections and neuropathy did not have a sustained reduction. The rates of hypoglycemia, fractures, and gastric bleeding also went down. However, interestingly, electrolyte imbalances and ketoacidosis increased slightly. Now, the per patient cost of overall medications actually went down 8%, that's per patient, but the overall medication expenses for the country increased by 148% because of the expanding population size. Interestingly, the significant increase in cost of glucose-lowering medications was offset somewhat by the lower cost of cardiovascular drugs over the same period of time. Therefore, on balance, at least in the Danish population, there is improved balance between medication benefits, harms, and the cost in type 2 diabetes. That is such an interesting analysis, Allison. To me, suggests that the glucose-independent effects of our newer and more expensive drug classes, like 
GLP-1 agonists we've talked about and the SGLT2 inhibitors, having impacts on renal and cardiovascular outcomes is paying off in the long run. And my final pick evaluated the impact of prolonged hybrid closed loop use in prepubertal children with type 1 diabetes. Dr. Elise Bithmus from the University of Paris in France and colleagues report on the extension phase of the Free Life Kid Artificial Pancreas Trial, where participants continued using the tandem control IQ hybrid closed loop system from month nine to month 39. 117 children completed the extension study and maintained improvement in hemoglobin A1C that had initially decreased from a median 7.7% at baseline to 7.0 at month nine of intervention and then remained at 7.0 at month 39. And importantly, this maintenance of glycemic control was not different for children entering puberty during the long-term follow-up and it did not affect BMI Z scores. So these findings indicate hybrid closed-loop therapy may help children accommodate the increased metabolic demands at puberty without deterioration in glycemic control or resulting in disproportionate weight gain. Which is really welcome information because puberty is tough enough as it is for a whole slew of reasons. And if you have diabetes thrown into the mix, it really can become quite challenging. So being able to utilize technology to help with that is great. And also we recognize the long-term legacy benefits of maintaining glycemic control. So any way we can help is obviously a good thing. And my attempt to segue this last piece that you suggested here, Mike, and then my next one is to bring out the point that teenagers sleep a lot. So my next one is about sleep. So my final pick is about one of my favorite activities that I don't do nearly enough, which is of course sleeping. And we already know that not sleeping enough or interestingly sleeping too much is associated with adverse cardiometabolic outcomes. But what about irregular duration? Like those who sleep too little for a few days and then try to catch up the next few days, which sounds frighteningly familiar because that's the definition of my existence. So Dr. Sina Kiernersi and colleagues from the Harvard University looked for an association between irregular sleep duration and incident diabetes in a UK population over seven years of follow-up. They looked at over 84,000 UK biobank participants who were diabetes-free at the time of providing accelerometer data in 2013 to 2015, and then prospectively followed them until May 2022. Sleep duration variability was quantified using the within-person standard deviation of seven-night sleep duration. Now, compared with a sleep duration or standard deviation of less than or equal to 30 minutes, in other words, a consistent sleeper where every night of the seven nights, they were within 30 minutes of sleep duration. So compared to that group, the hazard ratio for developing diabetes increased for every incremental increase in sleep duration standard deviation. After adjusting for other factors, when comparing those with sleep duration standard deviations over or under 60 minutes, the hazard ratio of developing diabetes was 1.11 with a stronger association among those with lower diabetes polygenic risk scores and longer sleep duration. So maybe this means that appropriate sleep consistency and duration are important for everyone, but particularly for those with lower polygenic risk scores, highlighting the importance of this modifiable risk factor in a population with low polygenic risk scores, and therefore we really can make a, a potentially a bigger impact because those with a strong genetic risk, we may not be able to make as much change. Well, thinking how I can get my sleep more consistent, Alice, my takeaway is that I should get more sleep during the work week and not try to set an alarm on the weekends. Brilliant. Well, this brings us to the end of our September 2024 special episode of Diabetes Care on Air. Big thank you to Dr. Rose Gubitosi klug Gail Lorenzi, Pamela Curtin, and Bill King, and to Drs. Barbara Blody, Christine Lamonte, Rodika Papasui, and Nina Sinha Gregory 
for spending time with us to help commemorate and celebrate the 40th anniversary of the DCCT edict study. Also, remember that Diabetes Care is continuing to take submissions of original art for consideration to be included on a future journal cover. Please subscribe to get notifications about new episodes of this podcast. And thank you for listening.